Right now, I'll be sharing some new training lessons that have made a big difference in my overall progress and recovery, starting with the concept of training less hard. Yeah, you heard that right. The stronger I get, the more I actively avoid training to failure. So in the past, I've recommended leaving one to two reps in reserve, and that's worked great. But these days, my average has creeped up even higher to two to three reps in reserve. And you know what? I haven't noticed a single difference in hypertrophy or strength. The only thing that's notable is my recovery being significantly better. And consequently, I can achieve progressive overload for much longer before having to rotate movements. So there's less overuse with more specificity. And in the long run, what's the net effect? Fewer deloads and plateaus, which is exactly what's been happening. I've only taken one deload this year and haven't had any stalls yet. Now the reason this works is because we're still in the effective zone regarding proximity to failure. Understand that all the best evidence suggests that leaving one to three reps in reserve is extremely comparable to hitting all out 100% failure. Just that there's less fatigue associated with that. Of course, for smaller movements like push downs, curls, and leg extensions, it's difficult to overreach and burning out isn't really gonna be a problem. That's why you see a lot of rest pause from me. But for main compounds, especially the ones with high technical requirements, why not turn down the intensity dial ever so slightly? You should get just as jacked, and for strength athletes, many have already been doing this for years, so we know it works. Like, check out Mike Tushare from Reactive Training Systems and learn what proper autoregulation can do. Heck, even when prescribing singles, they're not at 100%. You know what? I've also found this to be valid as a conjugate promoter. So I've been using the max effort method since the summer of 2014. And 2022, I'd have to say that training maxes are indeed superior. So guys like Matt Wenning were 100% right, just that you may not notice this right away if you're not super strong. All this to say, go for a RP9 instead of RP10, and for submaximal work, leaving more than one rep in the tank is perfectly fine. And just think about it. Do you actually go to complete failure on barbell back squats, leg presses, and good mornings? Just consider the fact that most lifters acquire impressive legs without ever doing that, and you'll start to understand why this really applies to everything. And just look at me. I started with a 45 pound empty barbell on good mornings and worked up to 240 for 15 reps and not once have I gone to failure. So if you can add 200 freaking pounds to a hard exercise by training less hard, why would you not do so? It's not about being hardcore. It's about getting results. Truth is, the people who say, oh, you train like a wuss, Don't hang with the top guys and are not up to date with what modern coaches and exercise science is recommending. So yeah, don't kill yourself in the gym. Lee Haney was right when he said, stimulate, don't annihilate. Secondly, since I briefly mentioned the max effort method, let's discuss its applications for lower body training. Through my experience and observations, I found that heavy squats are superior over heavy deadlifts. Why? because they're significantly easier on recovery, but still develop all the important muscles of the posterior chain. So they'll absolutely feed into your poles and lead to improved training sessions and weekly recovery. Deadlifts just fry you, man. And that's why you hear a lot of squat every day programs as opposed to deadlift every day programs. Natty or enhanced, it doesn't matter. Everyone who gets strong will tell you the same thing. At the advanced level, the stimulus to fatigue ratio is pure garbage. And that's why many bodybuilders actually stop doing normal deadlifts. And for hypertrophy, I generally agree with that sentiment. Now, going back to strength training, guys, if you're maxing out every week, I would strongly advise not doing double max effort deads or you will be destroyed after a few weeks. You either alternate back and forth between squat and dead or have a two to one ratio or even three to one in extreme cases. Mark my words, you'll get almost identical gains but net recovery will be infinitely better and you'll notice it. So don't stop doing heavy pulls, just de-emphasize them in the context of the max effort method. Besides, you'll get better results anyway by doing volume RDLs, good mornings, or using lower percentages in general. Whereas, when we talk about squats, a simple three by five is far more doable. Thirdly, let's switch the flow with the upper body and discuss the overhead press. This has been my main vertical push for years and I credit heavily for building much of my shoulder size and general strength. However, even though I love its benefits, I've now realized you don't need to over-prioritize it. By that I mean the frequency and repetitions for non-specialization. See, in the past, I did a lot of singles and triples, including with high sets and low reps. But now, 
I'm pretty much always in the 5 to 10 rep range, and the highest I'll go is 12 to 15. But honestly, the moderate zone is number one. On top of that, I only overhead press about once a week. Talk about broish, right? But you know what? Since making the switch, I haven't noticed any cons for size or strength. My numbers are increasing at the same rate, and my shoulders are doing just fine. In turn, this allows me to be more specific to my bench training without compromising the vertical pressing since I'm still maintaining the exact movement pattern while continuing to get stronger. So the major change is that on one workout, I'll do two horizontal presses and the other one horizontal, one vertical. By doing this, overall shoulder recovery is superior and that interestingly leads to more productive bench sessions. And when it is time to OHB, it always goes well. So it's truly win-win. Fourthly, for strength gains, I found that alternating between push and pull in the workout is ideal. You'll lift heavier weights and have an easier time crushing PRs. Reason being, well, you get at least an extra 10 minutes of rest for the antagonist muscles. And that makes a big difference when factoring in our high threshold motor units. So after bench press, instead of going right into OHB, why not do a back exercise first? Just complement your motions. And I promise your force production will go up. Like, I don't care how good your work capacity is, less fatigue equals more PRs. Not to mention the fact that it's impossible to be lazy now on two fronts. One, you're refreshed, so now there's no excuses. And two, the order itself forces us to not be lazy. Whereas not alternating often leads to some part of the workout being compromised, such as going hard on pushing movements and then being super lazy on the poles. How many guys do you know who do that? Certainly some powerlifters are guilty of doing this. And you know what? I honestly don't blame them. But isn't it interesting how for lower body, this usually isn't the problem? It's almost as if people intuitively figured out that it's good to alternate between squats and hip hinges or direct quad work followed by direct hamstring work or a more glute bias compound followed by a quad bias compound. You see what I'm saying? For upper lower programs and even full body, you always want to think about blending your system, all right? Lastly, let's end off on the topic of total volume. Over the years, I've realized there's a range I typically stick to and don't deviate much from that amount. Basically, my system doesn't fluctuate between excessively low and high volume. So when we talk about 10 to 20 sets a week being optimal, I'm kind of always in the middle. And honestly, this is probably the best for most people. I think Paul Carter said it best. If you can't grow from 15 sets a week, do you honestly think 20 is what's gonna do it? Sure, you may gain slightly more muscle, but that also comes at the cost of worsened recovery and having to manage additional training variables. Whereas sticking to a sustainable level is still exceptionally effective, but leaves less room for error and self-created problems. And you know what? Other experts like Menno Henselmans are starting to share similar viewpoints where you don't necessarily have to force progressive overload by constantly adding sets. I'll quote him. Doing more sets is not effective progressive overload. You could be stalling because your volume's too high, and then you can keep adding sets all you want, but you still won't make any progress in strength or size. And Progressive overload is not the cause of gains, but the proof thereof. Makes sense. If things are still working great and you enjoy what you're doing, why change? And you know, I finally understood this in 2021 where most of my benching volume was three sets. At the time, I'd plan on incrementally creeping it up to five sets if progress stalled, but what's interesting is that this never happened. So I just stuck to it and ended up smoothly reaching my goal. And now, over a year later, I'm using the exact same setup and still benefiting from it. So all this to say, guys, sometimes the answer is not add more volume. It's instead, be more patient and enjoy what hasn't failed you yet. And with that said, guys, I think that was an excellent way to end off the video. I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my wisdom, and I'd love to hear your feedback on some of these concepts. Can you relate? Let's hear it. And I'll talk to you all next time.